Hey parents, have you ever heard this phrase, those who don't learn from the past are doomed to repeat it? Well, the problem is all of these social studies books that we're using in schools today are doing a horrible job at teaching kids to learn from the past. They're simply teaching kids to learn about the past, and that's a big difference. I'm going to show you what I mean by going through this book today. This is United States History by, I guess, the History Channel by Holt McDougall, big textbook publisher. This is a thick book talking about American history. And I want to go through it and share just three examples to illustrate what I mean to show you that these books are not teaching kids to learn from the past. Now, as I do that, I don't just want to harp on the problem. I want to talk about a solution, a book, a new book that can teach your kids to learn from the past, to learn those inspiring ideas of American history, and more importantly, not just to learn about what happened, but how it matters to their lives today. So I'm going to show three examples from this book, and I'm going to show how we at the Tuttle Twins team have corrected those and solved for those problems in our brand new book. So first one I want to share. <laughs> this one boggles my mind because as we're reading through this, I've got lots of notes here, uh, trying to understand over the past two and a half years that we were working on this history book, what are the existing history books on the market getting wrong? What are they getting right? And books like this are fantastic if you're trying to learn superficial factoids, like if you want to impress people at a party or win Jeopardy or who knows what, like it could be good to cram yourself full of this, uh, these tidbits, these factoids. But I don't believe that that's why history matters. History matters because if we can learn from it in a way that empowers us to make better decisions about our lives today and build a better future, that's why history is important. It's the narrative, the context, the lessons that we can draw from history and make better decisions moving forward. And so as you read through the history in here, so much of this is superficial. It's here's what happened and they went here and then they... But what blows my mind Here's example number one. This is uh, the part of the book that's talking about the French and the Indian War, the Seven Years' War, as it's also known. And so here's the page in reference where it's talking about the book, uh, about the Seven Years' War, okay? And as you can see, it only gives one column right here to the Seven Years' War. And not even that, this top part of the column, this top section, is really the only portion about the war, and then down here is about the resolution of the war, the treaty. Why does that matter? <laughs> it matters a significant deal because George Washington's involvement in sparking the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, is what led to everything else. This is the beginning of all of the events that happen in the future, and to really understand the American Revolution, the development of the colonies, the Declaration of Independence, the self-government, the conflict, the taxation without representation, and all of those things, they all have a history here in the Seven Years' War. It was, in fact, the Parliament's desire to more heavily tax the colonies who they felt that they had been protecting with all their soldiers during this war against the Native Americans and the French and so forth. Those were the things that led to the later conflicts. So understanding the French and Indian War is critical if we're going to understand what happened later. To devote half of a column, half of a column, to the French and Indian War, to its causes, its events, the context, what was happening, why it mattered. Like, it just blows my mind that that is all that they're talking about in this, uh, in this book. So to contrast that, in our Tuttle Twins America's History book, again, our focus here is not just what happened, but more importantly, why it happened and how it matters to our world today. It's not just the stuff of history, it's the ideas, what people were debating, the values, the philosophies, because those are the things that relate to our world today. That's a history book that matters and that will empower your kids, and that's what we've tried to do here with this new Tuttle Twins book. So in particular, with the French and Indian War, I mean, we have several pages where we go over this and help people understand what's happening. And so, you know, here on page 94, you can see this is part of the narrative. We have, uh, it's all storytelling. And so your kids, as they read this, it's not just like a textbook where they're saying, this happened on this date and then this thing happened. Uh, what they're really going to learn is through storytelling, what people felt, what they thought, why it mattered to them and why it should matter to us today. And so as we talk about the war, of course, this is beautifully illustrated through Elijah's work. This is talking about the French and Indian War, but it's putting it in context about how this stuff mattered, not just at the time, 
but what was being set up in the future? Why future events were so critically tied to what happened here with the French and Indian War and how it led to kind of the separations and the conflicts and all these events that followed. So if we're gonna talk about the French and Indian War, at, le at least let's try and add a little bit of context to help kids understand why it mattered. I was really shocked by that one. Here's example number two, another thing that I was really shocked by, and that is the Sons of Liberty. Do you know what the Sons of Liberty is? There were also the Daughters of Liberty. We talk about that in this book. But the Sons of Liberty was critical. And this book, let me show you the first reference and one of the very few references to the Sons of Liberty comes to us on page 100. And it says, uh, this is talking about the Stamp Act. Protests against the Stamp Act began almost immediately. Colonists formed a secret society called the Sons of Liberty. Samuel Adams helped organize the group in Boston. This group sometimes used violence to frighten tax collectors. Many colonial courts shut down because people refused to buy the stamps required for legal documents, and then they go on talking about the Stamp Act. That, so what's the Sons of Liberty? Who, it's a secret society. Who's in it? What do they believe? What else did they do? Why did they matter? It's just like, hey, here's this group. Here's what they're called. And there's a couple other extremely sparse references to the Sons of Liberty. There's one just two uh, pages later talking about the Boston Tea Party. Three ships loaded with tea from the British East India Company arrived in Boston Harbor in 1773. Members of the Sons of Liberty demanded that the ships leave. There's another reference. But the governor of Massachusetts would not let the ships leave without paying the duty, and on it goes, talking about the Boston Tea Party. So again, kids are reading this, and there's no, there's no information here. There's no context about who these Sons of Liberty uh, are, why they matter, what their importance is. Like, none of that. And, and so I read this book as I'm flipping through it. I'm like, to not even really get into the depths of the Sons of Liberty and talk about the ideas they were debating, what motivated them, what they were fighting for, it's dismissing them as this group of just like, you know... I don't know, terrorists? <laughs> like just, here's this group and they did this thing. Okay, let's move on and talk about the next thing. And, and it's so disappointing at how little information is presented about the Sons of Liberty. By contrast, in our book, America's History, we talk about the Sons of Liberty on 13 different pages. This group matters because the people who were uniting themselves as the Sons of Liberty were doing so with great extreme risk. And they weren't just doing it to cause some ruckus and have a little fun. They were deeply motivated by a core set of values that led them to do what they did. We should understand that because, hey, maybe that might inform us today. Those of us who care about freedom in fighting against you know, government oppression or whatever the problems of the day may be, maybe we can learn a thing or two. Maybe we can understand what it was like to sacrifice so much when the stakes were so high. Maybe we can learn from history if we understand who the Sons of Liberty actually were, what they were debating, fighting for, what rallied them. Again, none of this being talked about in this massive history book. Not so in our book. So we've got this whole section talking about the Sons of Liberty here on the left. And we reference them and talk about them through the story, through this narrative, in so many different cases. Every year, on November 5th, anti-Catholic gangs in Boston would march through the streets to hang a mannequin of the Pope called an effigy on a large elm tree in the middle of town. Inspired by Patrick Henry's Virginia Resolves of 1765 against the Sa uh, Stamp Act, a secret band of Boston businessmen called the Loyal Nine reorganized these groups to protest against the act. Members started calling themselves Sons of Liberty. Their new effigy was of the local stamp collector and the large elm tree was renamed the Liberty Tree. With his life threatened, the local stamp collector quit. By the end of 1765, Sons of Liberty groups had popped up in each of the colonies and through pamphlets and leaflets, which we also talk in depth about their communication style, they communicated a unified resistance movement by boycotting British goods, burning stamp shipments, and threatening anyone participating in the Stamp Act they were successful in causing every stamp collector to either resign or flee the country. Now, I ask you, where is that in this book? Where is any mention of the, the gravity of the situation, what they were fighting for, the results of this? Like, they don't even mention it. 
So one of the big value adds in this book in particular, before I get to the third and final example from the textbook, is we're not just talking about what happened, but we're also, again, talking about uh, why it matters today. Right? And so at the end of every chapter, for example, here's the end of the chapter that I was just reading from. We have a section with a thought from either uh, Elijah or myself where we kind of summarize some of the events that happen in the chapter, again, focused on the ideas. And then we have this whole section where we say, let's talk about it. This section is designed specifically to say, the ideas that you read about, let's now talk about what it means for us today. That is the power of this book, is these end of chapter discussions where we're talking about the ideas, really summarizing them, and we're talking about what they mean today. So I'm gonna read just a very brief portion of this thought from Elijah at the end of the chapter because it's gonna show you the power of this book when we're talking about something like the Sons of Liberty. Here we go. In this chapter, there were two strategies the colonists used to attempt to make change. These strategies seem to be opposites and even contradict each other. The Tuttles, our characters, agreed that you can't change someone's mind with violence. Yet the Sons of Liberty certainly persuaded the tax collectors to change their minds about enforcing the Stamp Act, and they accomplished that with violence and threats. Yikes. So how do we reconcile the success of the Sons of Liberty that they had using violence with the peaceful approach of writing letters, sending petitions, and pursuing diplomacy? Open question. What do you think? Let's talk about it. This is a pertinent question for our day as well. This book has none of that. <laughs> Doesn't even mention kind of future context, present day application of this stuff. It's just a history book that talks about stuff that happened in the past as if we should care. But why should we care? Why should your kids care? Do they care? I didn't. I didn't like memorizing all these factoids and things. And yet that's what we're doing with kids today. All right, third and final example. This one, this whole chapter dedicated, chapter four, to the American Revolution, okay? You would think that in a chapter all about the American Revolution, we would start to get it into the ideas, what people were feeling, the debates they were having, the tension between opposing sides. No, <laughs> none of that is present in this book. At best, this book is talking about uh, some of the events that triggered the Declaration, but not the ideas, not the values. There's no synthesis, there's no why. Uh, none of that is, is put together at all. It's just, here's these things that happened, one thing led to the next. And, and think of it, right? When I was a young kid f being forced to read from history books like this, I would always just wonder, who cares? Why does this matter? It's just this, it's like reading a journal of sorts. It's like this happened, then this happened, then this happened, then this happened. And I never understood as a kid, why does any of this matter to me today? And no one could ever answer that question for me because no one taught me history the right way. That's why we've done the new book that we have. So there's about four pages in this book dedicated to talking about the causes of the revolution. But again, it's more just this event triggered this and this event triggered that. There's no discussion, debate, philosophy, values, ideas. None of this is present. It's just talking about these things happened and then we went from the one thing to the next and th this battle happened and these people marched here. That's not why the revolution happened. John Adams has this amazing quote where he basically says that the real American revolution happened in the 15 years before the first shot ever being fired at Lexington and Concord. We always think of the revolution starting with the shot heard around the world, right? And all the battles that followed. Not so, he's saying. What he's really pointing out is that it was an intellectual revolution. It was a revolution of ideas. It was people learning about these, uh, uh, the, these values of freedom and what it meant for them. And they would start to fight for those ideas. That is what the revolution was. It was John Locke. I mean, these books barely even mention John Locke and, and how persuasive his writings were to help people understand their rights, their relationship with the government, the abuse of power. These writings were insanely influential. These books give a passing reference, if at all, to understanding the power of John Locke's ideas, to which John Adams was crediting with basically the intellectual revolution that changed everything. So I'm gonna show you by contrast what we talk about in our book um, about the causes of the revolution. So, you know, we have this whole section. I mean, so much stuff happening here. We're talking about, of course, all the different founding fathers. We talk about their different stories and the different roles that they played. We talk about the timeline and what's going on. There's just so much here. 
It's all a story, it's all illustrated, makes it way easier for kids to learn. Here's just a brief portion of the story. Uh, this is Emily Tuttle talking. I bet the war made people mad. The Redcoats talk taking over Boston and shooting at their militias was already happening. What else had changed? Uh, Emily knew she was onto something when Fred pointed his finger at her and smiled. You got it. Something did change. First, Congress received a response to the Olive Branch petition. And this is, this is one of the key things for the Continental Congress that's starting to shift. And so Fred is the teacher. He's talking about these things. And here's what he says to the kids. Here's the big question, he says, and the subject of our lesson today. And he's dealing out these, these like trading cards that have the founding fathers on them where they're learning about each one. How is it, Fred said, that in January of 1776, almost no one was even talking about independence, but by July of the same year, again, we're showing this little timeline here, but by July of the same year, delegates to represent their colonies in Congress would adopt the Declaration of Independence. How did so many people change their mind in only a few months? How did they go from being loyal British subjects to defiant traitors and rebel patriots? That is the question. Understanding the causes of the revolution help us understand why history matters. These books miserably fail, right? Now, as an adult working on this project and rereading books like this, I understand why young Connor struggled so much. I understand why I hated reading books like this because it was all just jumping from one thing to the next and learning who went where. It's like a game of risk. These people moved here and then they moved there. Like, why do I need to memorize all the movements? Why do I need to understand the battles and the names of people and places and all these things? And I never really understood why any of that mattered. But the ideas matter. They matter to me. They help me understand how to make better decisions today. They help me to interpret current events and political battles and my own fight for freedom and trying to rally others to that cause. I can learn from the past to help myself and others repeat the mistakes of the past. But these books don't do that at all. These textbooks completely fail. And that is why we set out to create America's History 1215 to 1776, the first in what we hope to be a four volume series that doesn't just talk about what happened in the past, but more importantly, why it mattered and how it applies to our world today. As I said at the end of every single chapter, there's material not only to synthesize, summarize the ideas, but to talk about how they matter to our world today. This is stuff that our kids need. It's stuff that you and I, frankly, as adults need because we read and learned, so-called learned, from books like this where we didn't really get it as well. I can't tell you how many times parents are reading our Tuttle Twins books and saying, oh my gosh, I never learned that when I was in school. And so these are stories that you can read as a family at the dinner table, have amazing elevated discussions. Again, not just Pop quiz, do you know who was in the Sons of Liberty? Because ultimately it doesn't matter. What matters more on a topic like the Sons of Liberty is what did they feel? What were the threats? What were the risks? Why did they decide to move forward despite all those risks? What can we learn from them, right, to impact our world today? It's these open questions that allow us to figure out what we want to do in our lives today. That's why history matters. That's why we should learn from the past, not from textbooks and their superficial history and their factoids and memorization and regurgitation of all the superficial stuff, but the ideas, the philosophies, the values, that is the whole purpose and intent behind our brand new Tuttle Twins, America's History, 1215 to 1776 book. Now, you're gonna to wanna to go to tuttletwins.com history. And when you go there, what you're gonna find is a screaming deal, not just on the book, but also on 200 pages of curriculum where we have all kinds of activities and projects for your kids to put those ideas into practice and remember them and apply them in their lives. So we got the curriculum, we got a professionally recorded audiobook that's like six hours long for this whole book. It's a 240 page book. And then we also have some bonus videos as well talking more about the stories of history. This is all a deal, 75 bucks. Go to tuttletwins.com history. This is an amazing, deal, not just to teach the stuff that happened in the past, but the ideas and how they apply to our world today. This is how history comes alive. This is how it becomes interesting. Young Connor would have eaten up a book like this that's storytelling, that helps understand kind of the ideas and what it means for little kids in 2022 and three and four in the years beyond, right? So understanding our history is critical if we want to understand our role in the world today. We can't look to the existing books to do it. I think they're all failing miserably. That is why we have created Tuttle Twins, America's History. Pick up your copy today 
at the link in the description below or head to tuttletwins.com history.